you know, we spent a couple of days talking about Islam, and we're actually going to continue. One of the reasons I'm hitting Islam a lot and Muslims a lot is because there is a lot of Islamophobia. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of distortion in the way that people see things. And I'm trying to turn things around so that, you know, we see the lens from a different perspective. I hear so many people talking about Muslims killing each other and Muslims starting war and radical Muslims and Muslims, 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 right? But I don't hear people talking about Christians killing each other. And Christians killing other people and radical Christians. I, re I don't hear that. And I don't hear it because I'm living in a Christian land and we don't see it that way. Like it's easy to see the people over there in a certain way, but it's more difficult to see it in our own world. So, but if you look at Muslims and you look at Christians and you, you see that, wow, essentially they're a they really act in the same way in the world, then it means that I can never talk about Muslims killing each other and Muslims terrorists and Muslims live without also thinking about wait a minute hang on but do Christians do the same thing and if so why don't I ever say Christian this that or the other thing you know what you know what I mean and so it's not an attack on Christians at all it's an opportunity to see wow I can step into the shoes of somebody on the other side of the world who's looking back on the United States which is fundamentally I mean a Christian nation in the sense that most, it's the the largest denomination of believers or body of believers so you look back on the United States and they could see me and my people in my country in the same way that I see them and you know if you get that it's really pretty mind-blowing because what it means is you've now taken yourself out of your own shoes and you've stepped into the shoes of somebody else and when you see the world through the eyes of somebody else, you see the world in a more complex way. And that's what this class is about. That's what I'm trying to do. It's a whole class on empathy. It's a whole semester experience in empathy. Where you get out of your own shoes and you go into the shoes of someone else and you just see the world through their eyes. And that's what intellectual development is. My tolerance level is really getting challenged of people in this land generalizing about Muslims and making statements about Muslims being violent and Muslims being this and Muslims being that when in fact I can make the same statements about Christians it's so my tolerance level is not it's really being challenged and so I'm offering you that opportunity to see that it's a really cool it's a cool idea you have this distinction you need to make with the military on one hand military as protection and on the other hand military as an instrument of the state and the state exists to reproduce the state to strengthen the state I be state I mean the nation to make nations powerful and to ensure that people in a nation have as much as they think they want or as much as they think they need that's the role of one's government to protect you and to look out for your interests well what happened after we got Osama bin Laden out of Afghanistan, which was Rafi's country, our government, people in the government, decided, hey, we're going to go into Iraq. Because we fought a war with Iraq in the early 90s, but now we're going to actually go into Iraq. And it's very clear at the time and afterwards that we went into Iraq because of oil security fundamental oil people had their eyes set on Iraqi oil our government our business people in charge gonna go after oil somebody else's oil but we were going to go after it and we're going to throw out Saddam Hussein. We're going to put a new government in power who will work with us and then we will have access to the oil. It has since come out very clearly that those were primary motivations for going into Iraq. So imagine if somebody came to war here because they wanted to get our coal or our natural gas. We'd be kind of upset about that. So I gave a talk in 2010. And the talk was called A Radical Experiment in Empathy. And I talked about the Iraq War. 
from the perspective of an average middle class Iraqi, Arab Muslim living in Iraq, average middle class, not any one of the extreme ideas, not anyone, mostly people are just living their lives and primarily disengaged from politics, just like most Americans. And I walked people through how they would see and did see the Iraq war. Us invading Iraq, overthrowing Saddam Hussein, causing just a ton of just disruption and oh my gosh, and ultimately wanting the oil. And that being really clear. And how Iraqis would see that. And I walked people through. And the talk went viral immediately in the Middle East. I started hearing back from lots of folks. It's since been viewed by, you know, a number, you know, a, a lot of people. Uh, and I heard back from one person in particular. Lots of people. All over. It's particularly in the Middle East. And I heard back from one gentleman from Iraq. And his name was Bassam. And Bassam said, listen, I don't know what, you, who, what you've heard about this talk, but I want to tell you, just as an average Iraqi, middle-class Iraqi, who doesn't really care about politics, who just doesn't care, my, me, my friends, my family, you are right on. Everything you said in that talk is right on. Right on the money. You walk people through the way you walked Americans through just to show them how we feel, what we're thinking, our experiments, putting them in our shoes, just people, just trying to live our lives, okay? So Bassem and I established a friendship. We went back and forth. We video conferenced a fair amount. He would Skype into my classes. At the time, I was teaching an intro to sociology course. I was teaching about a section on war, five weeks on war. I, I would have him video conference in and talk to my students what's it like here you are you're in iraq the war is going on it's, it's you know he lived in mosul and mosul for the most part you know was was uh, escaped a lot of the worst damages at the time from the war and it was really really nice he talked in this class a number of times and then let me give you go ahead next slide i'm going to run through these and let me give you a little bit Bassam lived in the united states for a couple of years. He did his master's degree at, in Michigan. And this is his wife, Mayara. This is him in Michigan. Look at the 19, look at the glasses from the 70s. You probably have, some of your parents or grandparents have glasses like that. I used to have glasses like that. So there they are, college students. It looks like pizza on the floor, just hanging out, right? So this is an old photo. Next slide. There he is at graduation. Look at, here's his cousin. Here's Mayada. Look at, she's beautiful. Look at him. He's not as handsome. Clearly he, clearly he, he did well by convincing her to marry him. <laughs> Just kidding, Bossom. All right, next slide. Here he is with some American friends. Really enjoyed the U.S. Just really got Got, just got a lot out of being in the U.S. Next slide. Here they are again. Here he is with some American friends. Next slide. Here's his house in Iraq. So he's middle class. Middle class family. And this is a big family home. So a lot of people can live here. Beautiful house, right? Next slide. Here's his brother's house. Nice. Next slide. Here's the university at the entrance of the University of Mosul. Look. Here's a shopping mall in Mosul. You see, it's a life. It's the life. Average. See, this is the point, was the point of my talk. Iraqis just living life. We, if, we, if we want to convince ourselves that these people have always been at war and they're always fighting and they're always this and always that, well, then it makes it a lot easier to just send our military over there and conquer them and take their oil. But if we see them as being just like us, then we meet people like Boston and we look at that shopping mall and that looks like a shopping mall that I've been in many times in the United States and many countries of the world. Then it's a little different. Here's downtown Mosul. Beautiful city. So that's where, he, that's where he's from. That's where his family's lived for many, many years. Beautiful. Just, just life. 
two years ago, I was sitting in a hotel room in um, St. Louis, and I just returned from Qatar, actually. So I was in jet lag mode, and it was three in the morning, and I woke up, and I heard buzzing on my phone, and I pulled up Facebook, and there scrolled through, and there was a post, and it was in Arabic. It was from Basim. And I knew immediately something was wrong. And I, I didn't know, I, I couldn't tell what it was, but there were a lot of emojis with sad faces and tears, and a couple people responded in English enough that I started copying text out in Arabic and putting it into Google Translate. And translating, and I realized, oh my God, something is wrong. Turns out, what happened was, the Americans had bombed his house and his brother's house. And an errant bomb or bad coordinates or something, but not anything dealing with him. Not anything dealing with him. Not involved in anything bad or negative. An, an accident in some way, but bombed his house. His wife died. His daughter died. That's his daughter in the bottom left. His brother died. And his nephew died. That's his brother's son. Now, this is just a bomb. Didn't even make the American newspaper, not even on page 17 or 18 or 26 of the New York Times or somewhere. Nothing. Irrelevant. But for me, it's not just a bomb. Next slide. So this is what Bossom typed to me in Facebook that morning at 3 in the morning. He said, Sam, this photo of Toka was taken in our kitchen the night before they killed her. They, they, my government. Okay? And my Mayada is gone. My light is no more. That's his house. Next slide. That's his brother's house. He himself suffered serious damage, broke his hip, was, had to go, later was able to go to Turkey for an operation. Next slide. Then he sent that. Now, here's what I want to ask you. How would you be if a foreign government came to your land in search of your resource and your life was destroyed and your light was no more? How would you be? How would you think? What would you feel? How would you engage with those people. How would that be for you? Your beautiful spouse, gone. Everything, every, your photos, your videos, everything destroyed. How would you be? I want you to meet Basa. Hello, Bassam. Hello, Sam. Can you first off tell me about how things are in Mosul? Uh, in June of 2014, ISIS entered Mosul and they uh, took over Mosul and started converting Mosul into fanaticism Islam. Uh, and then, uh, June, September of the same year, my house was bombed and I left Mosul. Uh, to Turkey and then stayed in Turkey for my operation for uh, four months, then back to Baghdad. And I've been in Erbil for about one year. I went to Mosul uh, three times in the last two months. The city has been destroyed after the war on ISIS. 
especially the old city. Uh, I don't think it will be habitable for at least a year. So it, this, this war on ISIS took toll on every person in Mosul, uh, whether being loss of life, loss of property, uh, loss of income. So this war on ISIS has devastated Mosul. I have been planning to go back to Mosul, but every time I go back, I find it difficult for me to go back and live right now. But I expect to be back within uh, four months. I think sh things should be better within four months. You know, Bassam, one of the things that I think many Americans, certainly of the generation of most people in this room, I think we don't make the connection between the war that we started and all of the events that have taken place over the past 16 years. And I remember, you know, you years ago, years ago, probably in 2007, when you spoke in one of my classes, that you said the Americans came in and they broke a system. You all broke a yep. society. And yes. you have to fix it somehow. Asalaamu As Alaikum, Bassam. Um, thank you for speaking with our class. Um, I know that you've been through a lot these past few years. Um, and my question is just a very simple one. I was just wondering, how are you doing? I am I'm a Muslim, but I am not. My, this, this accident drew me near to God. Near, uh, I did not pray five times a day before this accident. I started praying. I don't know. Some, there was some bond that uh, developed after my accident and the loss of my family, my wife, my daughter, my brother, my nephew. And then uh, when I, two minutes after the bombing, uh, I was just wondering what, ha what just happened to me. Uh, and then my, my hip was broken, my foot was broken, uh, my back was injured, I was bleeding. And then they took me to the emergency room. And then three, four days later, I realized that uh, God has blessed me uh, for some reason, why am I alive? And my wife, who was next to me, probably two feet away from me, she's dead. So God must have a plan for me. And uh, my life has not ended on this earth. So I better not uh, stay angry because anger will just consume me. I cannot do nothing. What can I do? Even if I stay angry, I have to go on living. Life goes on. And God gave us the the best, the best gift that we have as humans is, uh, is the ability to forget. I cannot forget my wife. I cannot forget my daughter. I cannot forget what happened to me. Uh, but uh, I have to go on living. Otherwise, I'll be destroyed. I have my son to take care of. Uh, so I, I just have to go on living. Hi, uh, I'm Stacy. Uh, Number one, thank you so much for speaking with us. But um, I really want to know how you're not angrier. I would be really angry. And ha like, how do you live every day knowing and like not being like just angry all the time? Sam, remember the last talk we had? This was the same question that was asked, the first question. Remember the last, last talk? Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you why. Uh, I told the, the girl, she asked me, one year ago, she asked me the same question, and I told her this, what I'm going to tell you now. Uh, for the first few months, I was numb. I did not know what had happened to me. And then I was angry for a few months. And then I felt that anger will just eat me from the inside. And it was hurting me more than it was uh, benefiting me. I've told Sam before, I have lived in the United States for eight years. I had friends who were Americans. They were very helpful to me. They took me inside their house. We spent our vacations together. I have no problem with any American because I, all I saw from you guys and from my friends was a good person. The problem is with the governments. So I don't hate you. I'm a Muslim. My religion tells me to forgive. And I always use my religion to guide me through my life. Uh, that's why I'm not angry at you, or any American. Right here. Hi, Say your name. my name is Ethan. And um, my question for you 
is when you think about uh, the United States political leaders since they came into the Iraq war, George Bush, Obama, and now Trump, is there a difference between them for you and the Iraqi people? Do you, or is it all the same? Is it just all the same with Americans? It's all the same. Nothing, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Still the same policy. Every president, new president, they will come and promise that he will. The problem now we have in Iraq is the corruption. Every administration promises that it will do something about the corruption, and nothing is being done. And uh, the revenues of the oil that uh, we're supposed to benefit goes into the, po the, the pockets of the politician, and uh, the regular person cannot get anything. No education, no health benefits, uh, salaries. It went up from the Saddam regime period, but now they're talking about reducing wages, reducing the pensions. Uh, so nothing has changed over since 2003. Hi, uh, my name is Jake, and I was just wondering, before the U.S. came in, obviously the U.S. did more damage to your family than ISIS ever could have, but what threat did ISIS pose to you before the U.S. came in? The way, the, when they first came in, uh, they changed our way of life. First of all, they forced us to grow beards, shave mustaches, cut our pants like uh, 20 centimeters above the floor. They forced women to wear veil. Uh, they forced women not to drive cars anymore. Uh, we have to close our businesses five times a day during prayer time. Uh, they stopped us from internet. They stopped watching uh, satellite TV. Uh, they started meddling in every affair. Uh, they changed the way of life. That's what happens. That's what happens. And so I'm wondering if you could say a few final words about to my students, most of whom are very young, about, about their lives, about their vision, about what you've learned these past years? Yeah. My, my, first, my first, I don't want to call it advice, but uh, I want to ask them to be more aware of people and places outside of the United States. I spoke to many soldiers in 2003 who came to Iraq. I spoke to many soldiers, and many of them, they have not heard of, of Iraq before. Uh, I think in your schools, there's a lack of geography teaching and history teaching. So you have to compensate by doing uh, personal work. You, we live in a global, I mean, we are very close to each other now. 20 years ago, what's happening now between me and you talking over the net was impossible. I visited Epcot Center in, two, in 1982, and uh, there was uh, talking about uh, a new telephone that you can see who's talking next to you. That was like science fiction in 1982. Now the world has been brought so close with this technology, so you have to be aware of, of everybody around you and that uh, life is not only about the United States. There are people who are needy. There are people who are uh, just like you want to be healthy. You want your family to have a good life. There are other people who want to be the same. Yesterday, I was watching on TV a guy who works in uh, some South America country, and he works for 20 hours a day in cocoa farms, and he gets $4 a day. I mean, come on. Uh, you, ha you have to be uh, passionate about other people. You have to learn of other people's needs. Hi, I'm Zoe, again, and I um, was noticing a lot when he was saying, or when he was talking about forgiveness, uh, and his religion and how they correlate. Um, I was talking to like other people and how forgiveness is in their religions as well. Um, and what I was thinking about was like, I feel like I've always been very forgiving, but I never really 
considered myself to be a part of any one religion. Mm -hmm. So what I was thinking was, is forgiveness just a part of psychology? Um, mm. Or is it just something that's rooted in religion? Or is it just something that's like a moral standpoint that every human seems to have the capacity to you, understand? You know, so my take on it, if I could be a sociologist for a minute, is that human beings have a natural capacity to keep going, a desire, a drive, just like Basam. His drive is to keep going. So he, what, what do you do? You just, you just, he could just lay in bed forever, but eventually he's going to keep going, and that's a natural drive. Because you're alive. Right? You're alive. You're going to go. You can't not just live. <laughs> so forgiveness is, is a psych psychological state of mind that goes along with that drive. It just helps to support it, to say, well, I'm going to accept. Forgiveness is just a different variation on accept. Yeah. And then looking out toward other people and saying, well... I can just hate, 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 but eventually that darkness really starts to eat at you, and then you don't want to hate. And when you stop, when you hate less, we call that forgiveness. Yeah, Everybody but it's really does just it. acceptance. It's just acceptance. And kind of like awareness at the yep. same time. And it helps yeah. when you know people, right? So it's like when you know, like he knows Americans, it's a lot easier for him than to look over here and say, wait a minute, hang on, all Americans aren't like that. Just like I know so many Syrians, and I have a very different perspective on what's going on in Syria than most people who don't know any Syrians, like, or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. And the same is true in U.S. race relations, as we'll do next class, we'll talk about, yeah. One thing that I keep with me is the fact that the oppressor may change. I mean, the, the United States went in and did blah, blah, blah. You can Might be like in Syria, the Russians exactly. or the Assad regime. And or you the erase the United States from the globe and someone else will have an economical interest that yes. will make a, ch a difference or a need of power or whatever. So, um, you know, this is my first year college experience and I'm trying to read the cues around. And one of the first things I noticed when I arrived the what I call the whatever phase that is mm -hmm. so typical here mm -hmm. and um, the way I see it is that the message in the uh, overall should be we have to care we have to care we have to care this is our business too and just like if you read about H&M is hiring kids and that's how they get their t-shirts to be $10. Do, it's your personal option to say I'm not buying there anymore. In the same way, what I feel we should stay with is Basim's pain is our pain. And, and then it matters that you know what's going on. And then it matters that you know that people are suffering and that you can take uh, um, ownership, accountability, responsibility, mm -hmm. at your level, at your tiny level, you can do it. Yeah. You know, th yeah, thanks for that. The, 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 thing, the thing I take from that is like, look, you know, Basim, here's the thing, y'all, right? One day Basim's just living his life, and the next day a bomb hits his house and kills his loved ones. And that's any, that can be anybody, anybody. And so it's not that I don't walk around, I personally don't walk around with fear and negativity and so on, but I do walk around with an awareness of lots of people and it helps for me because I'm connected to so many different people, including here in the United States. Um, what I've gained thus far in this class, and I think everyone can agree with me, is that we have the opportunity and we have the option to restore humanity. Watching that man speak in front of me and each and every one of us, like, I don't think we understand that there's conflict in other countries and we are so dense to judge. So what I wanted to do is thank you and to thank everyone here because we have the option to restore humanity and that is what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Yo. Yeah, thanks.